Barbie yeah. Arches. <laughs> you got talking to the mic. <laughs> Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Uh, so you were telling me, we were talking about um, Dolby Atmos a little bit. Yeah. I listened to it. I, I did the free trial on my phone. And I hear a difference in between Spotify and Dolby. Whether or not it's a good difference, I don't think my ears are qualified. But I hear a difference. I was listening to Post Malone and um, Circles. And I just would A-B it. I was in the gym, and I was just like going back and forth between the two and seeing what I could hear. With Atmos on, um, I, it felt like the vocal was more present in this particular song. Mm-hmm. Uh, like really right up in my face, whereas the Spotify version of it or non Atmos version was it just sounded like what it would sound like out of my speakers in my car, which is fine for me. Right. So, I mean, I'll mix my music for it. Is it, is it better or is it just different? I think it's, it depends on the song in style and production because right. you know you are making a completely different mix so you can either go all the way and just do something totally out there and wild or you can play it safe and try to just make the best like the closest thing to the stereo mix as possible yeah um so for something like that for circles you know that came out before i think before atmos was even probably i mean it was probably in the works but they didn't produce and mix that song or with atmos in mind at all right so who i haven't so that was a bad example for me to listen to well it might not be because i i think i did actually go and listen to that one because someone mentioned that like the guitar part or some lead part is like moving like in, in circle, circles around you, which probably. I thought was like, in, like fitting for the title. That's a cool idea that, you know, you can do with Atmos. It seems like it'd make you dizzy. Um, do you want the guitar to be circling your head? I don't know. Right. It's not going to circle your head at a show. It's right. So that's kind of like, it's cool. Um, and there's certain, I think Atmos mixes that are done really well. Like, I think I told you, my favorite is uh, Folklore right. by Taylor Swift. Yeah, I've heard of her. Um, yeah, it's a <laughs> it's a uh, it's a good album if you yeah. haven't. Uh, She's the girlfriend of that that football player, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. That's probably how you know her. Yeah, I didn't realize she did music too from the Super Bowl. Okay, uh, but it the way they did those atmospheres, like you're not losing anything from the main stereo version. But there are detail. There's just so many like layers of guitars and other instruments that are going on in some of those songs that the Atmos can spread all that out, and you can hear more about. You can hear more of what they put into it, right? Um, and pick out more details. And a lot of those mixes don't need to be loud and punchy and in your face like a rock mix. Yeah. So I think stuff like that works really well with Atmos, where you're trying to create more space to be in the song, but they, you know, they don't have things like moving all around. It's just kind of like you hear a mandolin come in, and then the guitar over here, and it's just kind of yeah. If you only have two speakers, then how's it gonna how's it work? They I got two speakers. I have two ears also. <laughs> it's some kind of psychoacoustics where. You know, if something is behind you in real life, you're hearing less of the high frequencies or whatever, and you're hearing it, you know, bounce off behind you. Like your ears are good at picking up on where something's coming from. Yeah. And so they're trying to recreate that in your AirPods. And Apple has their own version of it, and there's other companies that are doing their own version of it too. Um, But... Basically, I think of it as like one of those uh, 3D optical illusions that you have to like kind of look at for a minute before you start to like see the picture. Yeah. That's how I feel when I put Atmos on. I have to like think about the 3D space for a minute. Like if you're just listening passively while you're on a run, it might just sound weird. Yeah. But if you're 
you know, trying to think of yourself in that space and pick out, again, it, it depends on how well the Atmos mix was done, yeah. but you can definitely put yourself in that space and hear it. But again, it does like, because they're trying to put you in a room, it's adding more reverb and space that wasn't there in the original mix. Uh, and sometimes that's good. And sometimes that's bad. <laughs> Well, here's the main thing. I was talking to my manager friend, Jason. Shout out Jason Frizzell. He's also my neighbor. Um, one of his artists did a mix. Is it a mix or a mastered version for Atmos? Uh, it's a new mix, and there is Atmos mastering. All right. um, at the beginning, it was kind of all the same thing. Yeah. Now mastering studios are doing that too, but it's not it is necessary for someone to do it. Um, well, he did it. Yeah. Put the song out. And I just, I was actually, I was at his house this morning cause I was borrowing that microphone and he showed me the, um, the Apple streaming numbers in artists, uh, Apple for artists app. And it jumped from like, you know, whatever this is on the graph to this interesting for huh. this new release. That was an Atmos version. Um, and it was, I mean, like hundreds of thousands more. So I don't know what playlists he got added to, but clearly there are some Apple playlists that he's been put on now, um, that he wasn't on before with the Atmos version. Huh. So Apple is clearly, uh, rewarding those who, um, put out a, an Atmos version. Right. Yeah. Which means the next song that you and I do, which we're working on right now. Yeah. I'm probably going to have to. Hire you. Let's do it. <laughs> to do that mix as well, or, ma or version, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, if, that's, if that's helping more people hear the song, then let's do it. I didn't think it was bad when I listened to it. I just didn't know. I, I noticed the difference. I just had a hard time deciding, is this better? Yeah. Is it necessary? <clears throat> or is it just a cool new thing to listen yeah. to? I don't know. It, I don't know yet either. It feels... We'll talk about it in a year. I will... I don't seek out when I'm listening to a new album, I have it turned off by default. I don't go and, you know, sometimes out of curiosity, I'll be like, okay, what do they do with the Atmos? Yeah. If it's available. But me personally, as a listener, I know, and as someone who's been on the other side of things, I know way more work and attention and care probably got put into the stereo version than sure. the Atmos in most cases. doing that for... 50 years, 60 right. years. Um, and so Atmos is kind of a new Wild West where, you know, every process is different, you know. Sometimes, best case scenario, you have the people who were involved in the original production overseeing the Atmos and giving creative input. Yeah. But then there's other, you know, Atmos albums that, you know, it's an album that came out 20 years ago and someone just you know probably you know it's just like another day at work you know made an atmos version and yeah didn't put a lot of care into that version and it's not sounding much different it's probably sounding worse yeah uh yeah leave fleetwood mac alone yeah <laughs> <laughs> rumor sounds great just the way it is out of two speakers yes <laughs> i and yeah it's fun for me those Things like that are fun for the, you know, if they did space some things out, you hear it in a different way and you're like, oh, I never knew that part was there. Yeah. So like, that's cool. Yeah. But again, I haven't listened to Rumors in Atmos, so I don't know, but like... I don't know if there is one. Most of the time... I have the record right here, though. Yeah. <laughs> we could listen to it on two speakers. That I'm sure it sounds great. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, it's like, and, you know, if I... The average listener, I feel like right now, isn't... I think Apple's trying to make people aware of it, obviously. Yeah. But your um, average, average music fan probably has no idea that's what they're hearing. Right. Like, my mom doesn't know, you know, she... I don't she know what stereo is. She doesn't know if it's on or not. Yeah. On, you know, her iPhone, unless I'm like, oh, go into the settings and check Which I had to do like, based on your um, instructions. Yeah, like, I've to talked to, like, you know a lot of people that I work with about Atmos. Yeah. And, you know, most people are listening on Spotify, I feel like. 
So if someone does have Apple Music, which I do rec, I, I think the sound quality on Apple Music is way better. Yeah. But if someone happens to have Apple Music, you know, it's on by default. And I think that's my biggest uh, complaint about it is that people don't know that it's on by default. So you could hear, you could be listening to the Atmos version and not even know it. Yeah. Uh, Sneaky. And that's what I like as someone making the music. I would probably, unless, you know, we're really focusing on the Atmos version and thinking about that from the start too, I'd probably prefer someone to hear the stereo version first. Yeah, first. Yeah. So how do you make it in Nashville these days? It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here over a decade. How long have you been here? Oh, man. Uh, been I moved to Murfreesboro for college in... 2011 MTSU. Yeah. And then you were homecoming king, weren't you? Yeah. Thought so. Every year. (laughs) Uh, and then moved up here, I guess it would have been from Murfreesboro in 2016. Gotcha. All right. You've seen a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's changed Uh, a lot. When I moved here, I started a group, which you already know about, um, with some buddies called blackjack Billy I didn't start the group. They were starting and then I, we all met and I, um, they were a duo and then we got started, started it as a band together. Um, so we got a deal like two years after I got here with a label that's not in business anymore. Bigger picture was the name of the label. Um, and got a song on Sirius XM's the highway, the booze cruise did really well. It was number one on the highway for that summer. And that's how, that's how that gave us a huge advantage um, because it just, it was such big promotion, even though it wasn't terrestrial radio, it was still like a, like a minor league hit, so, so to speak. And so our, you know, our gigs got bigger and people were showing up more and you know, all the subscribers that listened to that channel knew who we were. And today um, that probably still helps a lot to be, to, to be on any radio, whether it's terrestrial or, or satellite, but there's so much social media happening. People, you know, people always talking about what are your streaming or what are your, uh, what are your social numbers or your social numbers? Except as we all know, I, I can, I won't name the artists, but there are some artists that have 20 million Instagram followers and they can't sell out marathon music works, which holds what? 2,000 people? 1,000 people? Something like that? Something like that. And there are some that maybe have 5 million Instagram followers. No, probably more than that. Maybe 10. But they can play Bridgestone. Arena. Yeah. <clears throat> so there's clearly no correlation between... When we've talked about this before in the studio. There's no correlation between social numbers. Because, you, first of all, you don't know if they're real anyway. How many of those were bought? How many are bots? Two different words there. Purchased yeah. and bots. And how many are real... And there's no correlation between that and hard ticket sales. So it's, you know, who knows anymore what, what the pathway is. I think it's every man for himself, every woman for herself. Um, but I'd be interested to see what your thoughts are because you record, not only do you work with a lot of bigger artists, which we'll talk about later, but you also will do demos for newer artists. I've sent you a bunch and, um, do they ever ask you like you're in there making their, their demos and their, their songs. And do they ask you? So like, what do I do once I have this recorded? I'm curious what it's like from an engineer's perspective. Yeah. I never have a good answer. Cause I feel like it's changing so much and I I'm interested in, you know, all of that stuff, the marketing, the distribution, the release, um, but I also kind of like being able to hand the song off and that's all I need to do with it, you know, because uh, all of that stuff is so unpredictable. And I think even, again, this is a very uninformed opinion, but I think even the people who are doing that all day, every day, you know, they'll admit that they don't know what's going to work and what's not a lot of times. So it's like, meaning like bigger artists or labels, everyone, right. Um, you know, you just never, you can, I think what you can do is 
do the you know best job you can with the the song itself and the production and mixing and mastering um and that stuff definitely helps a good song uh be heard by more people uh but yeah especially with the social media algorithms and spotify algorithms i like wonder sometimes if the people who wrote those algorithms even totally understand them Mm -hmm. you know like they might not even know they probably have an idea of what is weighted better and what tends to work and they have the bigger picture but i still think it has a little bit of a mind of its own and so i think you just have to be consistent and keep uh putting good art into the world and people will notice eventually yeah unfortunately because it's so there's no barrier to entry to making music you know like trying to make a movie there's independent films of course and there's kids making films on their phones but there's a lot bigger barrier to entry to making a movie making music anybody can do it for sure your mac comes with garage band all you have to buy is a mic you can buy a cheap mic for how much can you buy a cheap mic for 30 bucks easy yeah Uh, you know um and then you can stick that on Spotify or Apple Music or wherever. And so there's just so much clogging up the the pipes, in my opinion, that um, I'm convinced that the the one thing that's undeniable is getting people to see you play live. If you can get if you can sell tickets or charge a fee at the door and you've got fifty people to come see you that aren't your friends and family no guest list, um, everyone will take notice. And by everyone, I mean I don't know, labels, booking agencies. I bet 90% of artists in Nashville cannot get 50 people to come see them at the basement and pay $5. 50 people they don't know just by posting about the show, whatever marketing they can do on their own. I'll put any dollar amount that 90% of artists in Nashville can't get 50 people to pay five bucks to come see them at the basement. Go. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Do you agree? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Because we know all the artists, yeah. not all of them, but I've been to the basement a bunch. I've played the basement. Um, I love the basement, by the way. It's, it's, oh, yeah. it's my favorite. It's it's one of my favorite venues, the the OG basement. I yeah. like the basement East too, but I mean, I like the original. It's just it just feels like rock and roll in there. It smells like it too. I've probably been to more shows in the basement in the last year than yeah anywhere else. Yeah, just I don't know. Close Steve Gorman from the Black easy. Crows band had played at the basement recently. That's awesome. Um, okay, well, anyway, the whole point was like, how do you make it anymore? Um, I, I just think. First of all, you've got to be, I think you've got to be making different sounding music. It can still be country, but what is country? I mean, I guess it's whatever country artists are making and then that becomes country. But speaking about the Nashville country scene, I think you've got to be doing something different. And I think different, I I almost think different is better than good. There are so many people are great singers. There's a great, bunch of great singers. We clearly know that doesn't make any difference or everybody that was on American Idol would be famous. Yeah. And 99% of them aren't. Kelly Clarkson is, a couple others. Um, so if singing ability was it, then, it would, then we would see a lot more of these great singers that were huge stars. Songwriting, obviously, is uh, hugely important. But only if you're doing something that's different than the other 50 people that are putting a song out that, that day. Um, I, I, don't, I, think, I think you've got to do something that's unique and different enough combined with a good song. But I don't think a good song is enough. There's a lot of good songs, especially here. Some of the best ever written. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't hear them very often. You don't hear you don't hear all of them. But the, I think the ones that are doing something different are the ones that rise to the top and can get people out to see them play. I don't know what you think. I mean, that definitely makes sense. That you know, if you're trying to get people's attention, 
especially now that you have to do something that makes someone stop for a minute and be like, wait, what was that? Yeah. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill Murray, for example. Oh yeah. Not, not country. Although they've got a couple of songs that are like punk rock country. Some killer steel awesome. solos. Yeah. yeah. That's the steel on those songs are great, but it's very different. You sent it to me and, and apparently I'm, I'm late to the, to the, uh, to the show because a lot of other people have already, I sent it to other people and I'm like, Oh yeah, I love Bill Murray. I'm like, great. They got 500,000 monthly listeners on Spotify, so I'm, I'm behind. But something like that is just different. It, there's a lot of things that are the same, like they sound a bit like Ban Camino, um, but the way, that, the way that they're doing it is different. And it, to me, it's just fascinating. I saw a bit much of YouTube videos. They don't have a bass player, at least not in the videos I saw. Drums, guitar, two guitars, and a sax player. A nice. female sax player that was wearing a mask. It was awesome. So I'm sure that they're using tracks with some, you know, with some synth bass or something. But uh, it was different. It was fun. And I talked to my, I talked to like, like say, take my sister, for example, the average country fan. She's not in the music business. She doesn't know anything about the music business. She just likes country music, modern country music. What's on the radio today? It's the same song over and over and over with a different male singer singing it. That's what I hear if I ever put on the radio, which I never do. But when I have, um, I don't know what you think, but I just listen and I think, was that, this, was that a different, was that the same song? Was the, what was the difference there between that, one, that song and that song? Because it was the same tempo, the same melodies, same story. Yeah. I mean, that is definitely, and I mean, that works for that specific medium. But yeah, but what's works? Because a writer said this to me recently. They're like, well, we can't. It, it, I was furious. <laughs> he said, well, we can't. Actually, there were three other writers and me. And they said, well, we can't have. I wrote a second verse to a song that we were all writing by myself, the melody and the lyrics. And I came back and played it for him. And it was a different melody than the first verse. And they were just like up in arms, like, whoa, 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 whoa. We, we can't have, you can't have the, the melody be different for the second verse from the first verse. And I said, why? Have you ever listened to Post Malone? It's got like five different melodies in every song. Uh, Taylor Swift has different melodies in different songs. And, and it was just like, then, then the comment was what you just said, which was, well, it should be the same because that works. And I thought, works for, for what? Yeah. Works for who? Because if you think that country music is the most popular genre, it's not. Hip hop is. Then pop, then country. So I'm not sure what you're measuring works is, but... Working for who? Because it's certainly not the most popular, if that's what you're saying. If what you're saying is, well, it works, meaning the most people will like that. No, they won't. If they did, then it would be hip-hop. It would be a hip-hop song. That's the biggest genre. So I don't think it works, personally. I mean, it doesn't work. It can't... It, again, it just depends on what you're trying to do with your art. But if you're, if you have something that feels good, like a second verse with a different melody and you're like, well, too bad. We just can't use that. We'll just have to come up with a worse melody. That's or a worse second verse. Cause it fits, you know, this structure. Uh, I think, yeah, it's just less likely to, it might connect with some people because they're like, oh, yeah, this is familiar. I've heard this verse before. Yeah. But it won't, if you're, you know, if you're choosing the thing that's not as good for the song, then what's the point? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, playing devil's advocate on myself, you know, anybody watching this would be like, well, how many hit songs do you have, Patrick? Yeah, good point. 
I still have an opinion about it though. And I, and I think if you're going for, if, if your mindset is let's do what works, you're not creating art. You're on an assembly line, creating yeah. a product that work that, that maybe was that another person did before that got some, that got a lot of attention. But is that what you're going for? You're just trying to make the same art that everybody else has already made? That doesn't sound very artistic to me. Imagine if someone, if, you know, yeah, you plugged in an electric guitar and no one ever turned it up to distortion. Right. That's not what you're supposed to do with your guitar amp. Yes. That's how I think of it. Yeah. Um, I, I agree that there are certain, I guess, certain guidelines that, would make a song in the country genre. Instrumentation would be one of them. Storytelling would be one of them. But man, that was uh, that was that was disheartening to hear. To be in a room with with certain writers saying, "Well, we can't do that because of this," and it needs to be that way because it works. I ain't the person to be writing with. Then <laughs> you guys need to go write on your own. Because I'm trying to do something, I'd like to write something a little bit different and maybe be a little bit more creative and come up with something fresh sounding, if possible. That's my viewpoint. I'm with you. <laughs> Let's get those writers in here. <laughs> no, they're nice people. Let's I yell just, at them. They probably, they probably, you know what's funny is, we, I said, well, I'll tell you what, let's do two versions. Let's do this version that I wrote and then you, and then we'll do, We'll do the same, we'll do another version with the melody being the same as the first. So we cut, we just did like some little work tapes, but let's just do two and then let's listen back. And a few days later, we all got back on a Zoom call and they all said, you know, I've listened to both versions and I actually do like the second version better where the second verse has a different melody. And I said, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's a little something different. I mean, that's not that big of a difference, you know, in, when it comes to songwriting, making, the, making a different melody for the second verse. It's not much of a stretch. It's been happening for a long time. But to them, it, it was new. So anyway, um, you've been working with uh, some big artists, Priscilla Block being one of them. If I remember the story correctly, Priscilla put out, what was the big TikTok song she put out? Uh, just about over you was the one that really blew up for her. right. Yeah. But so she puts that out on TikTok, it blows up and realizes she doesn't have a recording of it yet, like a like a fully produced recording of it. So Justin is who ended up producing that. Justin Johnson. Yep. Shout out Justin Johnson, and also well known for being the original DJ in Salem Town. Very well known for that, which yep. everyone is aware of Salem Town. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so. And I didn't know Justin at the time, and I think we met at a release party or something, you know, through her. Um, and then thankfully, uh, when it, you know, she was called by all the labels after that moment and <clears throat> ended up signing a deal with Universal, uh, and she asked, you know, Justin, uh, Jake Curry, and I to all work together to produce some stuff for that EP. Um, and they, you know, gave us a budget and they were just like, do what y'all normally do, get some good session players on it. And we just had fun making, you know, an EP and then an album after that. And, uh, it was just like best case scenario in terms of, you know, the tools and people that we were given, uh, you know, we were able to put together just the best team that we could think of and make something that we're really proud of and yeah. I'm still really proud of. And it's, uh, you know, it's the type of music that I would want to, put on and listen to, which is like the dream in terms of, you know, what you get to make. 
Well, it's very cool that she kept her original crew that she was making music with, I thought, because she's smart enough to know the people I've been working with are making the kind of music that I want to make. And it's, I hate to use the term again, working, <laughs> yeah. but people were liking it. You know, you sign a major record deal. It's, it might be uh, enticing to go and get whatever producer and whatever studio musicians and, and we've got a budget and you, you, you uh, move on to a whole new thing, which is not going to recreate the sound that people like you for right now. And I thought that was pretty cool that she kept working with you guys and you know, that kept her sound, which is what was, was doing well for her. Totally. Yeah. And we were able to do, you know, what we had all been doing with her, you know, Jake, Justin and I had all been working on music with her, not all three together, but in some, you know, combination or form, you know, for years. And so it was just really cool. You know, like we're all just friends. It just felt like getting in a room and making music with your friends, you know? Yeah. Um, and just doing what we would always do. But we also got to call some really killer session players and uh, have... Jim Cooley mix it and Andrew Mendelson master it. Um, it was just the dream team. Well, you ended up getting a gold record for that album, correct? Uh, yeah. So we did a, um, I did a acoustic version of that song. Um, and so the song went platinum. Right. Um, and you know, I didn't do the main version of it, but the acoustic version is part of how they count all of that. It's awesome. So yeah. Where's your gold record? I need to order it. <laughs> <laughs> Too cheap. <laughs> yeah. So, so for, for people listening, like they don't just give you those gold records. Well, I guess it depends on, on the situation, but a lot of times you've got to you you have you can get one you've you've earned one but you have to pay for it yep. to have it made yeah yeah so i think if you are given if you know if anyone artist anyone is given one someone paid for it right the, the record company <laughs> had to pay a company to make that gold record and put it in a case and give it to you yeah what's funny is that that i wonder if it's recoupable <laughs> I wonder if you're paying back. I don't you're know. Paying back the the cost of your own gold record. Probably not. But yeah, it'd be nice as a little gift. Like you guys don't have to pay us for this one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it might be. I don't know. Uh, I've never been gifted one. Yeah. Um, you've also been uh, doing some work with uh, producer Butch Walker. Yeah, one Artist of my and producer heroes. Butch Walker. Yeah. yeah, I'm a big fan as well. Uh, in fact, um, the name of my podcast, Maybe It's Just Me, is the name of Butch Walker song. Oh, that's funny. To be fair, when I was starting off doing little monologues, like one-minute monologues, I was thinking, well, there's a lot of this stuff I'm doing here is just kind of my opinions and things that bug me. And, you know, I wonder if anybody else thinks like this or maybe it's just me. Then I thought, oh, but that's a Butch Walker song. Maybe I thought of that because I, I had heard that song before. Um, but I just thought, well pretty good title so i'm gonna roll Great. with it yeah um i have met butch a number of times he's one of the nicest guys yeah it's so nice how did you get hooked up with him and start doing uh some mixes for him so uh through adeem the artist and my friend kyle crownover kyle manages adeem and kyle had produced Deem's first full-length album uh, and had me engineer and mix it. Um, and so I guess at some point, Butch heard that album and reached out and started working with Adeem and I think writing. And then it just ended up that Butch produced Deem's new album and so when it came time to mix it I think Kyle just mentioned to either Butch or Deem you know like let's see if Robbie can mix it um, 
And so they sent me one song to mix and try it out. That was uh, a test. Yeah, for well, sure. I was like, let's see if this guy sucks or not. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so did that one. Everyone was happy. And then had the whole album come my way and got to, uh, yeah, work with Butch, you know, just getting everything dialed in. And um, yeah, it was just awesome. Great. Very fun. Still doing work together? Uh, yeah, we've done uh, one other song, um, and I'm happy to do more if, if it comes up. So in these cases, he's been producing the songs for these artists and then sending it to you to do the mix for them. Yep. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, on the Adim album, I mixed and then ended up mastering it too. Which I'm We've having a lot of fun with. Talked about you getting into mastering. You're you're becoming a total nerd, I mastering nerd. Love yes, <laughs> I love the nerdy side of it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's just a fun blend of you know the musical artistic thing, you know, and that's all audio engineering and pro some producing, but finding that balance of you know letting the art do its thing and not getting in the way of it and just capturing it. Uh, but also nerding out and yeah, you're reading mastering out. books. I saw in the studio the other day. Oh yeah. It's my favorite book. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I have two copies of it. <laughs> of course you do. One for the studio and one for, for your home. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we all have our thing, um, that people would say that's weird, but yeah. You're, uh, I, I saw that book and thought, I'm not even going to bother with this one. <laughs> I'm just going to pay you to do it. <laughs> it's, uh, I like, I just like knowing how things work. And I think that's what got me into music in the first place was just writing and just even trying to record my own guitar playing, you know, in middle school and high school and thinking, you know, I'm doing the same thing. Why doesn't this sound like, American Idiot by Green Day. Right. <laughs> and just trying to figure out, like, well, step by step, you know, what are these people doing and reverse engineering all of it. And uh, I like that there's just always more to learn. And, you know, it was the same thing with mastering. You know, I send all my songs to get mastered. And I have, like, a vague idea of what's going on, but uh, I just wanted to figure out how I could understand, you know, even if I'm not doing it myself on every project, knowing what helps the mastering engineer out, I feel like makes me a better producer and mixer. Uh, and just being able to speak that language too. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just a nerd. So if I get into something, I just want to learn as much as I can. Oh, and sometimes it. I'm sure you've received back some mastered versions and thought, hmm, I might be able to do this better. For sure. Uh, and yeah, it's always like part of the value of mastering is having a second opinion, you know, be the last check on an album. Um, and sometimes you get it back and it sounds way better. And sometimes, you know, you have that thought of, you know, I don't always know what's best. But if you have that gut feeling of like something's not right with this, it's probably true. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, just try it. You know, I, if I need to master it myself to get the best possible product, I want to know how to do that. And it's fun. Mastering. Nobody has any idea what we're talking about right now. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so going back to one of the things we talked about earlier, change, change gears here a little bit, TikTok. Because we were talking about how, what it's like for artists now coming up and, and not just even coming up, just artists in general now and relying on social media numbers and TikTok being one of those things, uh, TikTok's going to get banned. <laughs> Yeah. That's my prediction. I think it's going to get banned. What I read today was that um, that the bill passed 
meaning it can now move forward to actually be voted on, should it be banned or not, if ByteDance doesn't sell the company. Because ByteDance is the owner of TikTok. Gotcha. And if they refuse to sell it, then they have a certain amount of time before the United States gover- government would ban it in America. Hmm. Um, what do you think? It's interesting. I... What do you think about that? And what do you think about artists using TikTok in, sp- in particular to promote their music? Because you mentioned something about how if someone puts a song out and it doesn't do well on TikTok, they just decide, well, then I guess it's just not a good enough song. We'll just move on. Yeah, that's the interesting pros and cons of it that I've seen is like, obviously, TikTok has helped out a lot of artists. Like find an, find an audience, totally. And it is a great new opportunity, the same way YouTube was for musicians and creators. Um, and... So there's a lot of good that I think it has done for artists. Uh, but it, I also see it holding people back. You know, I'll be working on a song with an artist. And I've just seen so many times where it's like, I really like love this song, but it just hasn't done well on TikTok. And so an artist just will never record it or never release it because of that. Um, That's sad. Yeah, because it it's me some sad. algorithm, computer program that has decided to show it or not show it to a certain number of people. Right. Um, had had the 170 million v- listener users of TikTok heard that song, it's quite possible the song would do very well. Totally. But you have to hear it first. Um. So yeah, I I believe in. Again, I have no idea what I'm talking about in terms of marketing and releasing music. I know how to record it, but I think even if you release a song and it doesn't get much traction or attention or whatever, I think there's still value in, you know, maybe if the next song does well, will you have more music that's already available that people can go back and check out? It doesn't mean, yeah. What a concept. Yeah. Uh, So, I don't know. I think, and, you know, even the Spotify algorithm, I've been told values consistent releases. So, I just think people, you know, people, audiences are smart and they can see and appreciate when artists are being genuine in just making what they love. And I think if you're having fun making what you're making, then other people will have fun listening to it. But if you're just like, well, this might do better on the algorithm, maybe the algorithm likes it, but I don't think long-term people are going to connect with it as much. But yeah, the whole it getting banned in general is interesting. Because I feel like they've talked about that a few times. Yeah, Sean, what's the um, what's the actual ruling on this? Um, so this doesn't have to do with the law, but that you're talking about. But the National Music Music Publishers Association is saying that at the end of April, it's not going to renew its license. So more music that the National Music Publishers Association represents will not be renewed on the platform. So Universal's already pulled their music. Universal Publishing has already pulled their music. And this would be who? And the, and the National Music the Publishers Association, who is a collection of publishers. So that's even more music from all kinds of labels. Yeah, Pretty big. They'll pull out if what? They're not going to renew their... They oh, so they're definitely not renewing their, their deal by the end of this April. Huh. Is that related to the bill that's in the house, or is the, are those two separate things? I think it's two separate things, isn't it? So Yeah, because the, it's the United States government that doesn't want ByteDance to... They don't want to be in business with ByteDance. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if ByteDance doesn't sell it just to another company, then the government wants to ban it. 
or people in the government want to ban it. And that is what I read today where the bill has unanimously, I think, is it unanimously? I'm just going to go on record and say unanimously. For but sure. It was a lot 100%. of people. 100%. It was, <laughs> a lot of people, whoever, whoever made the decision, yes, let's put this to a vote. Mm-hmm. That happened yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, so the vote hasn't happened yet, but it had to get to that point to even be able to vote on it. I think it's going to get banned. I'm mostly saying that because everybody else says it's not. I just want to be contrary. Yeah. I mean, but I think if it does, you know, there is, this is coming from someone who doesn't use either of them, but it seems like Instagram reels could be a good yeah, alternative. Yeah. Good thing I kept those up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know YouTube had shorts. I yeah. I don't know if YouTube those. shorts are as popular as reels. Yeah. I don't think so. Definitely not as popular as TikTok. No. Um, yeah, I don't know. I well, probably, this is going to make people, well, I don't know if it's going to make people, this is going to separate <clears> some people, <throat> the people who are always looking for a shortcut by putting something on an, on the internet and expecting it to go viral. And then they have a career, which we all know hasn't turned into a career for anyone yet, because you have to do it for a certain period of time for it to be a career. We know. So it, we know it started some careers for people. Let's reconvene in five years and see if anybody's ever heard of, still listens to those people. Let's see if they still have record deals or if they still have radio play or fans coming to their shows. Maybe they will, but, but time will tell. Um, so this is going to separate people. This is going to separate lazy people from hard workers, people that are going to go out and play shows, play writer's rounds, um, get the 50 people to come to the basement you know, and continuously put music out, whether it was well received at that particular moment or not, from the people who don't want, don't know how to do that, have never done that before, don't want to do that, that want to take the shortcut and put something out on an on an app and expect a career to be handed to them. Yeah, and I don't think those two things are always an either or, you know, Going back to Priscilla, who sure. found yeah. an audience on TikTok, she was she was already putting doing in all of that stuff, all that work for many years. Yeah, um, and I'm sure other people that have done well. You know, uh, you have to be doing that in order for that viral moment or whatever to actually catch fire and yeah, uh, help you out for more than a week or two. Yeah, um, I remember talking to John Marks about this. Um, Shout out John Marks. Um, also one of the nicest guys in the music business. But when he was head, of, global head of country at Spotify, and before that, Sirius XM, which is where I first met him, um, he said similar things. He said, look, I, I can put a song by a new artist on Wild Country, and it, and it might blow up, but that could be really detrimental to the artist because if it's the only song they have out or or they don't have anything to follow it up with. Like they, maybe, maybe it's not the, maybe it's not the only song they have, but they're not planning on putting out three or four more that year. Then it could really hurt them because they get all this momentum on one song. And now they're scrambling to go record and maybe even write another one when really you need some, you need stuff in the pipeline. Like, okay, that one's doing great time to put out another one time to put out another one. And so he was really selective on, on who he would add to certain lists and the cure and whoever the curators were at the time for, for those lists that he oversaw because, um, you, you could, it could, it could really damage, it'd almost be like a one hit wonder, you know, it could damage someone's opportunities if, they just put one song out and it works great. Some of them are very young, never played shows before or not very many, didn't really know how to perform, hadn't toured ever. You know, if you have a hit song, you're going to need to go play some shows and that's going to consist of some touring. You know, people that hadn't had that experience yet. And so in the same way with with these social media apps, TikTok being one of them, it can we've seen it. We've seen the rise and fall very quickly of certain people, I wouldn't even call them artists, people who have put out a song or a clip of a song and they don't have anything else. It's going to be difficult to climb back up from that. For sure. 
<laughs> Did I leave yes. you speechless? <laughs> that was just. <laughs> I'm just in awe. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm sure you are. Um, yeah, I. I don't know. It. Uh, I don't know where it goes from here in terms of what the next thing would be, whether or not TikTok, you know, stays around. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're serious about your artist career, I think you should just, obviously you have to be aware of all that, but also just focus on the music. Have you read Rick Rubin's book? I have it. I have read the first few chapters and that's about it, but okay, loved what I've read so far. Well, I've got the audio book. I've listened to it all the way through once. So I'm working on my second way through it. Um, it's about five hours long. It's like, you know, a Joe Rogan podcast is three hours. So yeah. what's another two? Right. But he mentions, uh, he mentions a lot of things. But one of the things is sometimes artists look at their song or their album as the most important thing in their life. Like, this is the end all be all. I think he, I think are the words he uses to my life, my career. If this doesn't work, then I'm worthless. And he says, in his opinion, look, just look at your, at your song as this one small thing that you're creating right now, Mm. put it out and immediately move on because you have no control over what's going to happen to it. Once you release it, maybe it does great. Maybe it doesn't do great for three years. Mm-hmm. Maybe it blows up right away, but either way, you have no control over it. Right. Move on to the next song. That's that was the piece of art you put out that month. Now we're working on the next song and put that out. And he says, treat your music career like it's a hobby. Maybe it's the most important thing that you do in your life, but it's still a hobby that you're constantly working on and getting better at and putting out releasing music, releasing songs, albums, and maybe one day it will turn into something that pays money and it can be a full-time living for you. But in his opinion, look at it like it's a creative hobby that you, that you do because you love to make art and put art out into the world. And sometimes a lot of people will gravitate to certain pieces of art and sometimes they won't. Um, but if you're looking at it just to make money doing it, um, you might be, you might have the wrong intentions. Yeah, I like that. That, not to keep talking about TikTok, but that makes me feel. I just wonder, you know, I feel like a lot of artists that I see promoting music that way, you know, even if they are having fun and passionate about the art, a lot of times I feel like it's just like, Oh, now I have to make another TikTok today. And yeah, I wonder if it's better to do that, even though you don't want to, because I feel like I can see that. Or if it's better to find something that has nothing to do with your music that you are passionate about and make that a hobby, you know, and do TikToks about that or Instagrams, Reels, or whatever. You're saying to use a, an app like TikTok. <laughs> To, to prom- not necessarily promote, but for something other than promoting your music. Yeah, I mean, if you're an artist... To, to and, show another side of you, to not put all the focus on this song that you, that you put out. Yeah, if you're really into, you know... Podcasting. Podcasting or woodworking Wine. or whatever. Yeah, it's like, talk about that, if, if that will get people more engaged with... Yeah. Because they'll find the the music. Like, I'm thinking of, do you know Petey? Yeah, from you. Yeah. He, you know, he has great music, but I found out about him through funny reels that he was making. And he's great at that, too, of course. But I've never seen, I mean, I'm sure he does. I don't watch everything he releases, but I never see him just, like, talking about, his song on my Instagram reel. It's always just like some funny comedy thing Mm -hmm. and that I'll stop and watch. But if it's just an artist promoting the same song they've been promoting for a month, it's not out yet. I would scroll past that personally. Yeah. Speaking of pre-saves don't work. Yeah. (laughs) Nobody cares. 
but <laughs> that's just me. Not no, I agree. Uh, you can over you can you can ram it down people's throats yeah. all day long. It doesn't. It's not going to make them listen to your new song. Certainly, tell people you have a new song out. Do a, do a reel about it. Do a do a TikTok about it. Do it. Play a little verse and a chorus acoustically at your house and and say, "Hey, here's my new one." Yeah. But you're right to con- constant to the, if it's the only thing you're talking about, people just tune out. It's just like like white noise mm-hmm. because you've got how many artists talking about their new song. We were, before you got here, I was talking to Sean about. I was telling you about the. Um, this person I know, this artist I know who they don't, when I, when I see them, they don't ever ask me anything about me. First of all, uh, what I'm doing. I'm not sure they even know what I do for a living. They know I make music. Um, but all I ever hear from them are text messages about their new song. Pre-save here. It's like every two months, like clockwork. Here's my new song. Pre-save it. And I'm on a list that they put me on. You know, everybody's getting this message. And it's like, no. Yeah. I'm never even going to listen to it because of the way you're going about it. You don't care about, you don't, and I understand you don't have to know all of the people that are listening to your music. But when, when you're only engaging with people about one thing all the time, hey, I got a new song. Hey, come see me play. Hey, pre save my new song. It's just like, do you do anything else? This is all you do? And do you have any interest in me whatsoever? Or am I just an ATM machine to you? You're just trying to get me to stream your song or buy your whatever. Because anytime I see you, you never ask me, you never talk to me about anything else. You never ask me a question about me. So I just kind of feel like, I don't know if you're on any of those lists, but. Thankfully not. <laughs> I've somehow avoided. Well, I got on this most one. of those. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. But it, to your point, talk about something else. There's people have different sides to their personalities, different interests. Um, you know, different beliefs. Uh, well, we're both Christian. We, you know, I talk about different things that I'm reading or heard in a sermon or, you know, there's, there's so many other things that you can chat with somebody about or post on yeah. an inst- on Instagram or on TikTok or that might be intriguing to other people that, and then they'll maybe figure out that you also make music and go listen to that. I think that's what you're saying. Totally. <laughs> Glad I could say it for yeah. you. <laughs> well, man, this has been fun. Um, I like, uh, you know, I've been working with you since 2017, I think, in your basement. Crazy, yeah. In the house you used to live in with a bunch of dudes before oh, yeah. you got married. Um, walked through the messy house. And that's right. Well, we first, and... when I walked in, some, uh, someone referred me to you, and I walked in, and I saw your record collection, and on top was maybe Boxcar Racer. Sounds about right. Uh, some Blink. And I thought, ah, well... Blink's one thing, because everybody knows Blink, but he also listens to Boxcar Racer, which I'm a big fan of. So if he knows them, then I think he's probably making the same kind of music I want to make, which isn't, I wasn't making punk rock music, but just the same musical tastes. Totally, yeah. Um, so it's been fun to, you know, record all this stuff, some of my solo stuff, the Salem Town songs, and then watch you rise up to work with, um, you know, artists like Priscilla and working with Butch Walker now and... It's been a cool thing to see. At one point, at some point, I won't be able to afford you anymore, and you'll stop talking to me. Speaking of that, let's <laughs> let's go through that right graphic. now. <laughs> what do I owe you? No. Um, but I don't know if you got any, if anything else you want to add. Where can people find your? Uh, do you want people to follow you on socials or hear the songs you've cut or recorded? Yeah, totally. I try to keep my. I'm not great about it, but I try to keep my Instagram somewhat updated with what I'm working on and what comes out. What is At least your some Instagram? of my stories. Uh, Robbie Artress. How do you spell your name? Uh, R-O-B-B-I-E-A-R-T-R-E-S-S. ElevationRecording.com. That's another one that I probably need to go update. But uh, I try to keep current work on there and contact information and all that on my website. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, that's about it. Um, are you available for hire? If artists are listening to this thinking, well, I'd like to go record with him. Is that, can they do that or are you? Totally. I'm always looking for more projects and trying to keep busy and okay. like meeting new people and artists. And Best way to do that is wanna... to DM you on Instagram and uh, start a conversation? Yeah, Instagram, email, uh, which is on my website, whatever is easier. Um, but I always love to to find a way to be helping more people create more music and we'll find a way to make it work. Cool, man. Thanks for doing this. Yeah.